Agents Podcast. Lab Coat Nation, welcome back for another episode of the Lab Coat Agents Podcast. And today I am excited. I actually reached out to this friend and said, you should come on the podcast because we were having a conversation on the back end and some messenger thread. There's like 10 million of them going on in the Lab Coat Nation. And we were talking about investment properties. And uh, today we are bringing on a good, good friend of mine who comes from Miami. We met through the Lab Coat world. We actually met in Detroit, I believe, uh, at an LCA one, but she resides in beautiful Miami, Florida, which fits her because she's also very beautiful on the inside and the outside. Many of you in Lab Coats already know her. Catherine Ryan, she's consistently sharing in lab coats, goes live. Uh, we absolutely love her. And I'm excited for Catherine to share today because of what she's doing for her personal portfolio, for her retirement, for her exit strategy in real estate. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my God. I'm I'm thrilled. Uh, I, there's so many nice things about me. I don't even know what to say. Long overdue, my friend, long overdue. So let's start with, uh, for those that don't really either know you at all or know you very well, uh, tell us about where, you've, where you're from, because I, we can already sense that accent, um, and then how, how you kind of came up in the business. Okay, sure. So I'm Catherine. I live in Miami. Uh, I'm originally from Germany. I came here as an immigrant. I was an au pair for a family, uh, made like $150 a week. And uh, after my au pair visit, I decided to stay. And then I continued my acting, which I was doing in Germany. I was like on several TV shows and commercials. And I started doing stand up comedy. And it was actually really, really fun. It was a big, big passion of mine. And I realized pretty quickly that I'm not going to make the money that I want to make because. Since I'm little, my goal was always to be financially independent. And um, the goal was if I go into a store and I want to buy something that I want, that I don't have to think about it twice. Because I didn't grow up with a lot. And it was always so hard for me to see my friends having beautiful things and I just couldn't buy them. So for me, that was uh, financial freedom that I don't have to think twice whether I can afford something or not. So I realized with stand-up comedy, I'm not going to get there very quickly. And somehow I stumbled upon real estate. And uh, after I got my first check, I, I was, I mean, I was sold. <laughs> I, I, I mean, when I started it, my friend had to talk me into it. I, I thought this is not something that I will like. I thought it was the most boring thing in the world. And I didn't think that this was going to be something for me. But somehow real estate and I clicked. And I think the biggest passion for me is really besides selling a lot. I mean, I do sell like set between 70 and 100 houses a year. I think my biggest passion is to bring this, uh, this wealth to people through real estate. I love it. I love it. But I have to go backwards. I have to digress because um, I, we need to hear more about this acting and stand up comedy career. Because again, I've gotten to know you and yeah, <laughs> I, you know, we've had we've hung out, you know, we've hung out in, in, in public settings and social settings and had some cocktails and stuff. Um, I don't know that I ever remember you just telling you tell stories, but I don't know about telling jokes. So like, where does this even come from? Like, where do you because that's that's like everybody's biggest fear is getting up in front of, you know, in public, standing up and speaking, let alone having to make a room laugh which is really freaking hard to do because if they don't laugh, you, you kind of failed, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I got this from my dad. My dad was a very, very funny person. And um, my dad passed when I was 22, which also had a big impact on me wanting to invest, which I'm going to explain later. But when my dad passed, I was really in a, in a bad place because I, I was in my early 20s. I hadn't found my path. I hadn't found my way in life. And I was just in a very dark place. And I feel a lot of comedians, they are in a dark place and they are sometimes one of the saddest people. And it was for me, the light in this dark time. And it also reminded me of my father and kept him somehow alive doing the stand-up comedy. 
and I was surprisingly really good at it. And I, I was doing a stand-up comedy set on being single and dating guys and people were cracking up. I combined it with my German jokes and people really loved it. And I mean, obviously it wouldn't work now anymore because I'm married and have two kids. <laughs> so I would have to do like a family stand-up slash real estate jokes. I think I have enough jokes uh, that I could do a new set, but uh, it, it was a great, it was a great, uh, great for, um, transition for me from getting out of this dark place into something that, you know, is fun and makes people laugh. That's really awesome. That's really awesome. I, I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to tell us a joke, but somebody might reach out to you and ask for a joke. And I promise you the next time we go to an event, I'm going to put you on the spot and make you tell some jokes. This well, is great. Videos. There's videos on YouTube of me doing stand. Oh, really? Okay. So what is your YouTube channel? So now everybody's going to have to go find oh, it. Catherine Rain stand up. You, you will find it. Catherine Rain. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. So you then shifted into real estate. So what, what was that like trigger? Like, was it somebody? Was it something? Uh, what happened? Like what, what brought you over and where did you start? So I had this friend, uh, he was my realtor when I was renting and he showed us like three apartments. We rented one. Then the year later, he, sh again, we moved. And then he said to me at some point, he's like, Catherine, why don't you try to be in real estate? I think you would be really good at it. You're so smart and so quick. I think this might be totally up your alley. And we're still friends. And I tell him all the time, look, every podcast I do, every interview I do, I mention you <laughs> because you were the reason I started this. I would have never, I mean, I, I'm from Germany. In Germany, real estate people are like known as like sleazy used uh, car salespeople. <laughs> Oh, really? And uh, it's, it, it, the profession doesn't have like a really good, uh, you know, reputation. People gotcha. don't like it. So um, somebody actually pushed me into it. And then it took me almost a year to hang my license. And I, I was really not somebody that was like, oh, yay, I'm going to start in real estate. It was just something that, okay, let's try. And if nothing else to do, I was home with my son. He was a baby back then. It was over 10 years ago. And I was a stay-at-home mom and I just did it. And somehow real estate and I we clicked. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And so did you start on a team or did you just start on your own from day one? So back then the team thing wasn't really a thing. There was a few teams in my office, but weirdly enough, nobody ever approached me. So I don't know. Nobody ever asked me. I would have loved to be on a team in the beginning because I didn't know anything. I was working with that guy, Fred. He recruited me. I was working with him for almost a year just to learn things. And for me, this was a huge, um, and I feel like a lot of people underestimate the power of learning and the, the power of you know knowledge because the things that I learned in my first year, although I didn't make a lot of money right off the bat, uh, the things that I've learned, you cannot, they're, they're priceless. You, I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And you were in Miami when you did this, right? Yeah. Yes. I was never in real estate when I lived in LA or New York. Awesome. Okay. So when you started then, and this is really talking to either A, the newer agents or B, uh, like maybe the team leads who would have a newer agent. What was it, you know, what was your, what was your strategy? What was your trick? What got you into selling homes or, or was it buyers? What did you do? I just talked to anyone that I met. I was just a relationship person from the beginning. I would build really quickly relationships. I, I knew a lot of models and actors because, you know, when I, when I moved to Miami, I did a lot of modeling. And uh, I just went to a lot of parties and I was never the model at the party. I was always the real estate agent. And this is how I differentiated myself from everyone else. And I figured, you know, I'm not just the pretty girl that's a model. I'm the girl that actually has a real job. And it, it, it made a difference because I feel, you know, when I was a model, it was, or an actress, it was just about the looks, right? And, and I always feel just because you're good looking, that's not an achievement in life. And there's so many people that were with me in the industry, they were like so happy and so proud of their looks. And it's like, nobody, what is your achievement? You were born this way, that's not an achievement. So I wanted to really be somebody that does something with her brain other than just being the pretty girl. And uh, I just talked to anyone that I met in the elevator. My husband was always so embarrassed. He's like, can you stop talking to people? 
<laughs> I would talk to people in the elevator. I, I would make sure that everybody knew that I was in real estate, even if I was with friends or with moms on the playground. I would do it subtle, but I would always make sure that they know I'm a realtor because I didn't want to be the person that then later I found out that they bought a house with someone else. And uh, and I somehow it it worked. And when I would ride in the elevator, what I would always do, I would like bring... Um, a pile of flyers, I always have my flyers in the elevator. So people would like start talking to me too. And I would smile at them. They would give me the business card. I met people like in my old office, we had a UBS in the building. I met so many people from UBS just because I was always there with my flyers. So I would always start conversations with people. And I think that is one of the number one things that has really helped me in my career is just to build deep relationships with people. I love that. It's, and it's so simple, um, especially for somebody who's new or again, somebody who's mentoring someone to leverage your past life, essentially, uh, whether, whether you're coming out of college and you're leveraging your, you know, your college friends and your high school friends, or you changed careers because that's like a, a blank canvas of potential opportunity and people who know you and already trust you and like you because you're one of them. Right. And I think, well, uh, I didn't I, know anyone in Miami. That was the other thing I had just moved to Miami. I was new to the city. I didn't know anyone. So there is a lot of realtors that I'm competing with right now. They grew up here. They are in social circles. They grew up with money. They grew up in like wealthy neighborhoods. I didn't have any of that. I grew up poor. I came here with $750. I didn't know anyone. I just started talking to people. So just because you don't know anyone or, or you know, you don't have any social um, ties with people doesn't mean that you cannot be the agent of choice for some people. Yeah, I love that. Well, when you said you were going to like modeling um, groups and things like that, gatherings, was that you or your husband? Because by the way, her husband's also a model. Um, so which 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 was it? Because you didn't know people in Miami, but you were still going to these networking groups or parties. What was it? So, you know, because when we moved from L.A. to New York and then from New York to Miami, we moved for my husband and he was a model. He was one of the top 10 male models. <laughs> Sounds so cheesy to say that. <laughs> but, um, so then I started modeling, too, because there was not much acting going on. So I did a lot of fitness modeling. And between you and I, I really hated it. I can't stand still. I like to move and do things and, and, and talk and just to stand still and pose. Like, that's not my thing. It made me feel very awkward to stand still. But I did it because I had to make some money. And I, I was talking more about like the auditions that I went. And sometimes there were modeling parties. Like I participated in the model beach volleyball tournament. So there was an after party. I went to a photographer's birthday party. I met all those people through, you know, my modeling circles in the beginning. I love it. I love it. It's, it's, it's a simplistic approach, but yet powerful. And um, if, if you're, if you're going to become a real estate agent and try to hide uh, behind doors, you're not probably going to have a lot of success. I mean, this is a, this is a networking and people business and you've, you've got to figure out how to get out there. I always say, I mean, you know, I have this people that are pounding the phones every day for eight hours and they are successful too. They are just the people that are not very social and they have to do that. But I'm not that kind of person. I'm not going to sit eight hours on a phone when I have this talent to talk to people and be social. And there's nothing wrong with either or. It's just, you know, when I started in real estate, people told me all the time, oh, you're never going to be successful. It's just luck that you met all those people. It's not going to last. And uh, I just find it very discouraging to say that to a new agent because there's many ways to do it. And there's no right way. There's just your way. Well, 100 percent agree. And, and, and to that point, you're right. There's a lot of people that, that will have a lot of success and will continue to have a lot of success door knocking um, and, and cold calling and doing all those sorts of things. But it's very rare to find somebody who says, man, when I wake up in the morning, that's what I want to do today. Right. They do yeah. it because they have to. Yeah. Um, but networking is a hell of a lot more fun. Relationships is a hell of a lot more fun. Attraction is a hell of a lot more fun. It's fun when my phone rings and I don't have to call someone. Right. Um, and also, like, I'm not the kind of person that when people call me, 
it turns me off. I don't like that. I don't like being sold. And the people that I work with are the kind of people that would not work with anyone that cold calls them. So, and then at the same time, the people that like to be cold called are not the people that would like me. So we're not a match. And there's enough other people out there that like my approach. I love it. I love it. So fast forward, let's move to, to today. So by the way, what did you say? And if you did repeat it, when this started, so when did you start in real estate? What year was it? 2011. Okay. So you've been in almost 10 years now. Um, and so let's fast forward to where we are today. You said you're do you're selling roughly 70 to hundred houses per year. Are you more on the buy side? Or are you more on the sell side? Which, which are you? Normally more on the sell side though. Right now we're very buyer heavy because of this market. Got it. Okay. So now here we are, uh, before we get into the investing side, which is, is the meat and potatoes of this thing. Um, what is your strategy today? Is it, are you still on the same, are you still doing the same things in terms of getting business and just nurturing uh, your SOI? Or do you have any techniques that you would like to share with the audience of, of what's working for you today? I'm, I'm still very strong on my SOI and uh, I do also postcards. Once a month, I send out postcards. I've been doing that now for 10 months. I don't know the return quite yet. Um, I've been told you have to do it for at least a year to see. So I've got a few listings from that too, but mostly a sphere of influence and relationship building with people that are outside of my industry is also very, very important. I can tell you how many listings and buyers I've gotten from people that are in a completely different business and that I helped to connect with other people. So I've, I'm always like a giver. And that's my strategy in life. Like I don't ask for things from people. I always give. And eventually something comes back because that's how karma works. And I never give somebody with the intention of getting something in return. I just give. And if something comes back, great. If not, that's fine. I could not agree with you a million percent. Um, and that is the lab code agent way. That's the Tristan Ahumada led uh, right. I mean, it's coming from contribution. It's kindness. It's don't expect anything in return. And when, and when that happens, it comes in return. Stop asking, stop being that sale, that salesman yeah. who's always asking. Because you're, not, you're not, I mean, I always tell my buyers and sellers, I'm not a salesperson. I'm a consultant. And this is really how I feel. Like I don't want to sell them anything that I don't believe a hundred percent in myself. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is I'm very strong also on agent referrals. So I have very strong relationships with other agents. I think during this pandemic, there was a lot of people that were depressed and sad and weren't doing that well. And I helped those agents. I was always there for them. I, was, I always had an ear for them when they were crying. I, I lifted them up. I helped them. I reached out to people. And again, here is the giving. Um, I, I, I was just giving and people will remember when you're there for them in times of crisis. And I build very strong relationships with those agents. I'm always like, you know, when they have a listing appointment, they call me, they're like, Hey, what, I, what do I need to do? How can I do it? People call me and I, I'm so flattered and I love it. I mastermind with agents all the time and it shows because I'm getting a ton of referrals. So that's also a very strong side of my business. Love it. I love it. And you've been recognized too. So Catherine is Keller Williams and she has received a lot of recognition from the top brass at Keller. So clearly she's doing something. Uh, Catherine, before, again, before we get into the investment side of things, uh, what's something that's most recently that you've been recognized for by possibly even Gary Keller himself? Cause I know I've seen your name popping up. Uh, what is it that you're doing that you can share with our audience that has, you know, allowed you to receive that recognition? Um, so the, the last two years, I was the number one solo agent in the whole state of Florida with Keller Williams. So that was so far my biggest. Um, I'm in Gary Keller's top 100 masterminds. And I do a lot of virtual videos. So at, at family reunion, Josh team even mentioned it. He's like, Catherine has all those beautiful houses in Miami. So I guess they, they know me for doing my videos and just being always out there on social media. And that, that makes me really happy that they, you know, see me and recognize me. I love it. Is there anything unique that you're doing by, by way of video or do you have a full-time videographer? Do you do your own videos? What do you do? I don't have a full-time videographer, but I have a full-time uh, marketing manager. So I basically record the videos, she posts them, she downloads them, puts them on YouTube, reposts them, premieres them on Facebook. I mean, I couldn't do all of this by myself, right? This is not a one woman show. I have a strong support team behind me. 
And uh, when the pandemic hit, what I did, I just jumped on video because I don't, didn't want to sit at home depressed on the couch. I just did it, you know, to entertain myself and to show every buyer and seller that business is still happening. And somehow it worked. People really appreciated that I was out there. And in the beginning, people thought I was crazy. They're like, who's this blonde chick? Like, she's still like taking videos. Uh, what's wrong with her? <laughs> but it was all vacant houses and it was fun. And I had on some of my videos, 5,000 views. So it really changed the whole perspective of uh, open houses because why do you need to do a, a real open house if you can do it virtual and have more views? Yeah. And then I got super efficient also with my buyer and seller consultations. So everybody that wants to work with me, they have to do a Zoom consultation with me first because I'm not going to anybody's house unless they're committed. And that has saved me so much time. So I had I didn't see the results like right away, right away. But now four months into having, well, I've, I've been doing those consultations since March, but now I also hired a showing agent that does all the showings for me. And it's now four months into it. And we're six weeks into the year and I already have half of my goal reached this year. So Ooh, it's been paying off. Yeah. that is insanity. That's awesome. I am uh, so proud of you. You, uh, you are a, a great person that people should be following. And, and like, like you said, I mean, just, just, just putting yourself out there, you, get more eyeballs because you put yourself out there because you put yourself in front of a video camera and you're not doing anything that's, that's not attainable. That's not duplicatable. That's not something that can be emulated. And uh, this is what I tell people all the time. It's like, when you're trying to figure out what should I do, what kind of strategy should I implement? I say, go, go follow three to five people on social media that you enjoy and then emulate and then make it your own. And um, you are a, you are one of those people that I highly recommend people go follow. You do have one advantage that being in a Miami market, but that doesn't mean that's not the reason. You're just you're just using what you have, and 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 making you know again making use of it. But everybody has some sort of an advantage in their market, and you just need to find it and use it. So for, for, for me, it was always, okay, perfection is overrated. A lot of people are like waiting for the right moment. They're watching video after video to prepare and they never do anything. So you really need to do something. And then the second thing is you need to be different because if you're just like everybody else, why would somebody want to work with you? And I know I'm different because I'm a little bit crazy. I'm not salesy. I'm, I'm, I'm a fun person. And I know that, and I try to bring that into my videos so people see they're not working with someone that's boring or someone that's a pain to work with because, you know, you're going to be with those people for three, four months. You want to make sure that they're fun, that they're entertained. And I think that is my strength and that's what I use. But you can also be a serious person and make it your thing, right? <laughs> exactly. Just be you. Just be you and own and own that because it'll be, it'll be easier to do stuff too because... The more, the more that you try to get outside of that zone, it makes it more challenging to actually come up with stuff because you're not being yourself. If you just be yourself, right. it's that easy. I love it. So now here we are and, and you have achieved some amazing success. And then all of a sudden you're sitting there one day thinking to yourself, I need to create some passive income. I need to uh, create some potential retirement income. I need to create something that doesn't force me to have to sell real estate for the rest of my life. Yeah. And okay, so how did this start? And I know that you own some, some homes in Miami, but you also own some homes in the mountains, uh, which there's no mountains in Miami, folks. So uh, how did this get started? Where did you start? So it, it started when I was very young. Uh, we moved into a house when I was five. And we moved out when I was 19. So we lived in that house for 14, 15 years. And it was a brand new house when we moved in. And we rented it. And when we moved out, the house was paid off. So we paid that guy's house off. And it was worth three times more than when we had moved in. And we moved out and we had nothing. And I just thought to myself, how stupid is that? So that was the first thing because my parents, they, my, my mother was a secretary, so she didn't make a lot. She made like $800 a month. My father, though, he was an engineer his entire life. He always saved money, always had three pair of pants, three pair of shoes, like put all the money aside, but didn't have anything. So that was something where I thought to myself at age 19, whatever I do in life, I never want to be in this position. So then number two, when my father passed when I was 22, 
and my father was an engineer, you would think that he has wealth, that he has provided for his family. And for my dad, it was always very important that we were we girls, because my sister and I were his first children, and then he had a third child with another wife. His priority was always that we were taken care of. Yet when he passed, all I got was a few thousand dollars. So that was number two, where I thought to myself, my dad always cared so much about us, yet he did not plan correctly. And I don't ever want to put my family in this position because I was 22. I had bills to pay. I you know, was depressed for a while because I lost my father. It was just a really dark time in my life. And I knew I wanted to do things different. So I bought my first house in 2012. And it was a small house for $300,000. We saved every penny because we had to put like $75,000 down because we were immigrants. You don't get a loan so easily when you are not an American citizen. So we bought that. We sold it three, four years later for four thirty dollars ish So we made a nice profit. We, we bought the next one. And from then on, almost every house that I bought, I kept. I sold a few. I sold a few. Um, I sold them only when the, when the return was not great or when the house was like older and needed in the future, more repairs, and it was just not a viable investment. So now I have eight properties and I want to get to 15 in the next two years. Okay. Where are the eight currently? So I have five in Miami and three in the mountains of Georgia. And they are a very mixed portfolio. So I have a, one, my, my primary, which is my, my biggest asset. Um, I want to mention that my, my house now, I have a big house now. It's a five bedroom, 3,000 square feet. Well, for some people listening, probably that's not big. For Miami, that's quite big. Uh, and I did not move into this house until I already owned five houses. So I lived on very on a very uh, modest budget with my primary house until I had several investments. I see a lot of people that buy with me houses that buy houses twice as big as mine or twice as expensive as mine, yet they don't have any investments. And it's a little bit shocking for me sometimes, but then again, this is their choice, right? Uh, I always felt like I needed first to earn the rights to own a bigger house. So the house that I had before, and b- back then I had two children, I lived on 1,200 square foot. My son was nine and my daughter was um, three. And we lived in a small house. So that house we then sold. So, okay, one is my primary. It's, it's my biggest asset. That one, we bought the cheapest house on the block. There was only houses, two, three, four million dollars. Uh, we bought it under a million dollars, put a little bit of money into it, and it's now worth double two years later. Nice. Um, then we have a little condo in South Beach. That one I paid off in full a few years ago. We bought that with seller financing because the guy offered it to us and we didn't have any closing costs. So it was very convenient for us. That one I bought with the intention because it sits, it's in a really nice area and it's a condo. There's only 41 units on a three quarter of an acre piece of land. And I bought this with the intention that we're gonna get bought out in the future for redevelopment. Then I have a commercial space, which is, this is my best asset. That one we bought for 480 and it's rented at 6,500 a month. So wow. that rented to a bicycle store. I also have an offer from Starbucks to rent it for almost double, but I really like my tenant and I can't kick him out. You know, I don't want to kick him out. <laughs> Oh, will Starbucks wait for you? <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe. I mean, it sits on a on a on an intersection of two main streets, and it's a storefront uh, space. So that one we bought. Wow. It hit the markets. I knew it was underpriced. The listing agent didn't know what he was doing, and we needed to move quick because they had cash offers, and I didn't have the cash. So we put in a cash offer and took a hard money loan. And we refinanced it four months later and appraised for 50% more. Yeah. And wow. And raised the rent with the bicycle store. And now it can probably sell for like triple. Yeah. And that's three years later. That's amazing. And and I bet I bet Starbucks is willing to do a lot. I mean, don't most of those kind of tenants do really long-term leases? Yeah. This guy did six years, uh, but he has a renewal clause. But it's, it's have, you, have, you, have you- The guy is a really good tenant. 
I, I get it. I get it. I, the only reason I asked is because we were looking at buying um, a building for Taco Bell's once and Taco Bell wanted to, they wanted to do 15 and 20 year leases. And it was like, wow, that's really solid. Like you can't beat that. No, that's solid. And you get an increase every year. And then it's a triple net lease. He pays for, well, no, it's a double net lease. He pays for insurance. He pays for all the maintenance but I pay for the taxes and the HOA fee because it's in a small boutique uh, condo building. Wow, that's cool. Okay, carry on. So that's, that's three. That's it. Then this one where I'm sitting, that's my office. Unfortunately, it's not really cash flowing, although I pay rent to my husband's company for tax reasons. Um, we bought this with the intent to rent it out, but then I had to put my foot down and told my husband, I need an office and I absolutely love it and need it. And then we have- uh, So that's a, that's a commercial space, right? Also commercial space. It's storefront. Let me let me turn. I can see the cars going by in the uh, in the in the reflection. Oh, you do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is my office, and I, I've seen enough of your videos that I've, I I pretty much could. Well, I know your office pretty well. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so that's my office. It's uh, and then we own also a new construction home that we we have partial ownership in in Miami Beach that I have right now for sale. So that was an opportunity that a developer gave me a listing, and he said, "Hey, listen." Uh, do you also want to invest? And you put uh, a substantial amount towards the house. So I'm not just getting my commission. I'm also getting some profit on that. So those are the Miami investments. Now, then this past year, I went on vacation to Georgia in the mountains because we come from the mountains. We're from Bavaria. So we missed the mountains. It was the pandemic and I really needed to get out. And I was sitting there at this beautiful house that we booked last minute. It was the only one that was still available. It was three fifty a night, so it was expensive. And I sit on the terrace. It was my birthday. I sit in the sun. I pull up my phone and I look on the Keller Williams app how much the houses in the area are. And I almost dropped my phone because the houses they were like between one fifty and four hundred thousand. This is not my. You're not in Miami anymore, Catherine. And I'm like, <laughs> what? I, and and I I knew in that moment because I'm really good with math. I knew in that moment that I had hit a gold mine. And uh, I think what, two, two, two months later, we bought the first house. Then two months later, we bought another and we just recently bought a third one. So I went like boom, 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 boom. boom. I, I, re I remember this because you were you were sharing, you were posting pictures in our Facebook group. Um, and then you were talking about this. I watched this go down and I was like, damn, this is amazing. Uh, so. Yeah. So tell us like what the metrics are here, because obviously buying in your market's one thing and you've kind of got a mishmash in Miami, but yeah. when it comes to buying in a market that's outside of yours, like what were you? And so first things first, mm -hmm. this isn't always the case, but you looked at those prices compared to where you lived and you were floored. This is the, this is what a Californian goes through when they buy outside of California. It's like, holy crap, how I can buy this massive house for nothing. Um, yeah. Uh, so, but in your case, was there a certain metric that you were looking for in terms of price point? Um, how much money did you put down? What kind of an ROI were you looking for? How often does it rent? Tell, tell us about those metrics. Okay. Sure. Um, so on the vacation rentals, I was new to the vacation rental business. I used to be a vacation rental agent before I started in real estate. So I was familiar with rates and how it works and the turnover and all of that. However, I, I didn't know how much those houses rented for. So what I did, I went on Airbnb and I looked how much the houses in the area rent for, right? So I did my, my market stats and I always also checked how many were available during certain times because you also want to buy something that is always uh, rented. You don't want to have too much availability because that shows you the demand is not there. So I saw the houses were always booked and there wasn't really that many houses. It was a small community. So that was number one. For example, I would never buy in a in a place like uh, somewhere by Disney because there's just such an oversupply of properties that you're not going to be the special one. So I uh, realized pretty quickly uh, it's, it's a community of 300 homes. Uh, most of them are, are primary homeowners. They're not going to rent for vacation rental. And it was pretty new in that area to have vacation rentals. So that number one, then I uh, figured out how much they rent for. And then I did my mortgage calculation and I believe always in putting a substantial amount down, but that's just me. You know, everybody can do it different. I put on all properties, 25% down. I could have gone probably with 20, 
but I decided to do 25%. And I just did a calculation how much is the mortgage going to be. I mean, you can pull out a mortgage calculator. And so on the one house that we bought uh, for 175, uh, my mortgage is like $800. And the other one we bought for 283, the mortgage is like $1,200. So I was like, okay, if I can rent it for 200. Is that, is that fully escrowed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I, I, I did the math. I'm like, okay, if I can rent it for 200 a night, that's six night a month to break even. Can't be that hard. So uh, it was a little bit of a leap of faith and it totally paid off because my husband designed the houses on the inside so nicely that our houses don't rent for 200, like anticipated. Our house rents for 450 to 500 a night. So because of, because of the way they're decorated. Yeah, my, my husband just made them nicer. Like if you look at all the other homes, they just look like, you know, those mountain homes, dark, dark furniture. I always look like still mountain homes, but they look fresher. They look beautiful. They have plants. They have, they're just a little bit different. And here again, the power of being different, right? People are willing to pay that price if you offer something better. And we also give them a gift basket. We have a property manager that we hired right away. And this makes us also different. She is a substantial expense on the houses, but we're also making more than all the other houses. How, so, how much does, how much are you paying for the property manager? So for, we pay her between 500 and 350, depending on the size of the property. On the big house, we pay her 500 a month. On the other one, 350, which oh. is for that area quite so a How lot. much? Is that but per month? Week? Per week? Per month, per... Per month, per month. For that area, it's quite a lot. Nobody pays that much up there. Um, but I find it absolutely necessary because when I look at my per hour, how much I make per hour, she gets all the phone calls from all the guests. She puts the Christmas decoration up. She comes when a light bulb burns out, when the electric is out, she brings them candles. She does all this kind of stuff. If I would have to take all those phone calls, I no. Well, that's so what what uh, what percentage does that equate to? Because usually when you're thinking of vacation rentals and management, you're thinking like they take 20, 30, 40 percent. Um, do you know what that percentage is? Because this is that's this is unique by comparison. Like if you go to the panhandle in Florida, let's stay in Florida, for example, which is a very common second home, second condo area. You hire a, a management company and you're paying them a percentage of the rent. I have that, too. I have okay. that too. I have a company. uh they are called Evolve Vacation Rentals. They take 10% and they are in charge of getting me the bookings. So they do the advertising, they do the contract. I have insurance with them. Uh, it's totally worth it because they get me the bookings and it's only 10%. It's really not that much. However, they don't do the housekeeping. They don't do the cleaning. They charge for it um, and give me then the charge, but they're not doing any of that. They, they manage it, but they don't they don't do it. So there, that's just an extra cost on top of the 10%, but 10% is nothing. Not nothing. Yeah. I mean, they just manage the bookings, but they don't manage the actual house, but they put up the pictures and all, all that kind of stuff. So the, yes, we do have quite some expenses, but um, when I tell you between October and mid January, our income on two houses, gross income was 50 grand. Say that again. 50 grand. No, between oh. how long? In October and mid January. So it was three months. We had 50 grand in income. On on how many properties? Two. Two. The third one we just bought and we're renovating it. The third one is gonna rent for like five to six hundred a night because we're turning it into a five bedroom. It's gonna be really nice. I'm guessing that you're not gonna tell our audience where this is in Georgia because you don't want to. <laughs> well, there's nothing for sale because I've you know, I've told quite a few people about it and there's right now nothing for sale. I think I could right now resell all the properties for at least a hundred thousand more. Because the market, because I bought it right when the pandemic hit. Yeah. And, uh, it, you know, people were still scared to buy. And especially on the countryside, people don't know how this is going to play out. And the third house, especially, we got to steal because I told my property manager, look, if you find us a great house, we're going to give you a little bonus. Find us something off market. And she found us this house that needed a lot of repair. And it was in a condition where it couldn't be financed. So it had to be a cash deal. So I bought the house. They offered it to us for 180. I bought it for 160. I put now 40,000 into it and it's already worth 450. Oh my God. So I'm not reselling it, but I, you know what? I, I probably won't. I'm just probably going to rent it out vacation rental. So 
Um, would yeah. you would you say that part of your success here is um, going somewhere that not a ton of people were going, as you said, almost like seeking out a new area and then kind of, you know, you almost single handedly turned it into a vacation rental area, it sounds like. Well, there was some vacation rentals before, but it was not to that level. I feel like we were the first ones that did it like really professional. There is a, a, a person that I met, the guy, the guy actually that I stayed at his house. I looked him up on the tax record and I figured out he lives in Fort Lauderdale. So I called him up. I'm like, hey, tell me a little bit about it. And he's calling me now for advice. And he's been doing this for years. He has actually more houses than me. And he's, he's surprised that we're so successful. He said he didn't make any money the first year. I mean, he broke even barely and we we're cash flowing. Like that's massive. insane. That's insane. So, but, but, but it, it, to me, correct me if I'm wrong here, when you think of vacation rentals, you know, you think of, uh, when you think of mountains, for example, you think of Colorado, you think of Utah, you think of Tahoe, you think of this traditional places. And maybe that's the mistake that a lot of people make is they go places that were the, the the price point is already so high it's very difficult to to gain a return but if you go find these areas that are kind of like diamonds in the rough potentially and there's probably thousands of these opportunities out there those areas i mean there's not just one area people are like where is it where is it i want to buy there too i'm like you can find another area like this you just need to go somewhere where it's family friendly i mean this place has a public golf course it has mountain tubing, has zip lining, has beautiful waterfalls, shopping close by, restaurants. You just need to find a place where people can rest and be in nature. I even made a video about the area. I mean, the first thing for me was I fell in love with the area. I really love the area. I'm passionate about the area. And I I knew if I was going, if I was gonna like it, other people will love it too. And whenever I post those videos, people always wanna come to my vacation rentals. So that's amazing. And, and so th that's another thing. So a, she found an area that she wanted to go to and then kind of, you know, figured out that there was opportunity there. Uh, another thing that I think was very important is you, you probably invested a little bit of money and your husband has a knack. My wife's the same way. Like I could give her a blank space and she'll make it sexy as hell because she's good at that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, she hates my office because of all this sports stuff in here. This is not her style, but if I gave her a home, so my point is, is you, 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 you gave a, a little budget and said, make this look nice because yeah. we're going to be broadcasting it on the internet. That's how people find us. You look better than the dated home down the street yeah. and that sells your house and commands a higher price point. So simple. Right. Um, and, and I think I, I, this is just amazing. And now here you are in a position. Now, my next question is, when are you retiring from real estate? Well, um, I don't know if I will ever retire. I just love it so much. But, you know, just to have the feeling to have some FU money and to step away whenever I want is a, is a really good feeling. And I see sometimes really old realtors still pounding the streets. And I definitely don't want to be that. I don't want to have to work. And some of them don't seem happy. Some of them love it still. Don't get me wrong. Then nothing wrong with that. But I see some that are like unhappy but they don't own any investment properties they don't have anything to their name except their primary residence and it just blows my mind when you sit at the source and you don't take advantage of the power of leverage because this real estate business can make you so wealthy and so yes to answer your question uh, I want to be in a so right now I could already retire if I moved to the mountains and left Miami so I wouldn't have to work anymore so I'm in a really good place but if I was to stay in Miami, I probably have to work two to three more years to, to achieve the same. But I don't think I will retire in three years. Let's put it. And, and how many and how you want to, you're at eight, you want to buy, you want to have seven more by when? By how many years? Uh, in two years. So two years. I want to get this year at least three to four properties. So the way I see it is, okay, so when you pound the streets, and I call it pound the streets because you know, it's a lot of work in real estate and you pump the streets, <laughs> you, you pay the highest taxes on your income, on your active income, and then you pay less in taxes on your rental income. And then you pay the least amount of taxes on your capital gain. And I really want to be at a point where I pay less taxes. So 
all this money that I'm making, I'm paying all those taxes on. So I want to shift a little bit over to more passive income. And uh, at the same time, you have to pay to play. If you are the person that claims no income on their tax returns because you have so many expenses, you don't qualify for mortgages. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. They make no money on paper and then they want to get a mortgage and then they wonder why they don't get approved. So, you know, you got to be honest <laughs> with your with your taxes. So I do pay a lot of taxes. Yes. But I want to take advantage while I still have this income that I have right now to buy more properties so that then later on, I don't need to show this high of an income anymore because I don't need to buy that many properties or those properties show so much cash flow that I get mortgages without having a high income. Yeah. Wow. Back income. <laughs> it, it's, it's really amazing. It's a, it's a fascinating story. And, and this has been fun. I mean, you know, starting, you know, going all the way back to Germany and then the, the coming here with 750 bucks and, and stand up comedy and acting and, um, I, the one thing that the, the rain family has going for them is looks they, um, they, they, they don't lack in that department. And I'm, I, I, I'm not afraid to judge a man. I have a beautiful wife and, and, and I, I love her, uh, but your husband is a very attractive man. I'm not afraid to say that. Um, and so that, uh, I can't imagine your kids so are going to go him. ahead. You go. I think, I think I told you this the I first time I met you. <laughs> I don't think he needs a lot of that though. Like you said, he was a top 10 model. Um, well, he doesn't do it anymore. You know, he retired, he got tired of it. He's like, I can't do this anymore. That's awesome. Well, and he, and he married well too. So not only did he marry well um, in the looks department, but he married well in the, in the success department. I tell and, him that every day, but he doesn't always believe it. <laughs> well, he was with you from the beginning. So he's been there with you. The, through the yeah, thick but he this. was with me when I was broke. He was broke too. So we were both broke. So yeah, well, that's awesome. I mean, you got, you guys are, I would love to, I, I look forward to the day I get to meet him. Uh, because if, if uh, he's even a half of as awesome as you, um, it, it would be a lot of fun. So you, this has been an awesome story. So Catherine, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, if somebody wants to pick your brain, um, because again, I, all I've been doing is passively watching on the back end, because I'm just fortunate enough to be in the same groups as you, right? Um, and I'm watching your story and thinking to myself, damn it, I, I probably should have reached out earlier and bought in Georgia with her. Um, what, well, how can they get a hold of you? What's the best way to find you? Um, you know, I'm on Instagram. I'm on, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Clubhouse. I'm on all those social media sites. I also do Ask Me Anything on Zoom every first Friday of the month at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So I started doing that because I have so many people that want to pick my brain. And I thought, you know, why not do it with a big group every other month or every month I'm doing it so that other people benefit from the answers and everybody can just ask away. And I started doing that and it's like, it's a great success. And, you know, I have people tune in. I also have clients tune in. It's a really nice mix. Wow. What a great idea. Tell me when that is again. It's every first Friday of the month at 3 p.m. on Zoom. And uh, just reach out to me and I send you the, the info. I think we also have a web link that we just bought. It's called meetwithcatherine.com. And I think you can register there, but you know, my social media manager is doing it. So I don't know if it's all set up yet, but <laughs> it should be. That's, that is a fantastic idea. And that's Eastern time, by the way, she's Miami. If you hadn't picked that up yet um, as an agent, this is just one last little nugget that I didn't even realize. What a great idea, because not only my guess is, is you're probably having real estate conversations with potential clients, which is brilliant. Uh, because you're staying top of mind, it gives them the opportunity to come talk to you. And it probably gets you connected to agents all over the country, which then feeds back to the referral thing. That's really freaking smart. Did you come up with this idea? Somebody, uh, no, somebody, no, I have to give credit to somebody else. I forgot who told me because I spoke to one of the top agents and I said, you know, time is really my most valuable asset. And I'm a person that likes to give. I like to help others, but it really cut into my time when I was meeting with agents all the time. And people want, like I had three meetings a week with people mm -hmm. and it was just, you know, cutting into my production. And I also didn't want to turn them away. So I thought what would be a better way to meet with people? And most of the people always ask the same questions. So I thought, you know, if we can put them all together in one group and make it like a little networking event, it might be really beneficial. Do you uh, promote this? Do that. 
I just started telling people about it um, because I have people reach out to me all the time from lab codes, people from, you know, that see me on podcasts or that, that see me on stage on events. They always ask and then I refer them to that. That is so awesome. How many people do you get on average per call? Is it as, is it as few as one or two and as many sometimes as I'm... Two, sometimes 10. It really depends. It depends how, how often I put it out there. I think the next time I do it, I'll put it on lab code agents just to, you know, <laughs> to, 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 to... Be careful what you wish for. Yeah, what I wish for, right? Yeah. But I also want to encourage other people to do that because it's really a nice way to give back to people. Because when I started, I had a lot of people that mentored me and still I have a lot of people that help me and mentor me. There are so many agents out there that are so much better than me. And I'm never shy to ask for advice. And let me tell you, those people that are top producers and top agents, they're always willing to share. 100%. So uh, don't be shy to ask. That's right. I, I say that all the, that's a great way to end this. Uh, you and I hang out in the same circles, so we know it better than anybody all of these people we're hanging out with, some of the millionaires, we probably hang out with billionaires in our circles. I know I do, and I'm sure you do too. Um, they're all willing to share. And so just don't be afraid to ask. The worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to ghost you. Uh, yes. there's, there's nothing wrong with that. So just uh, so don't be afraid to ask to make yourself better. Catherine, this has been awesome. It's been great to catch up. It's great to see you uh, great. Since, yeah. since we don't get to do this kind of stuff much anymore. This has been great. Thank you for sharing. And I have a feeling... Uh, after this podcast airs, you're probably going to get a few more people uh, on the Ask Me Anything, the meet, the meet with Catherine. So awesome. Look forward to it. Love it. Thank you so much Thanks for having me. Welcome Agents Podcast.